With Frozen 2 now out in theaters, there are 58 Disney animated studio films. So today, we're gonna rank them from worst to best. <music> Hey everybody, my name is Justin. I love to watch movies. If you guys love to watch movies too, you guys are in the right spot. Make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. Today, I'm bringing to you guys probably my biggest video ever on YouTube, and that is 58 Disney movies ranked worst to best. So, before we do get into this ranking video, there has to be a disclaimer, a few disclaimers. This will not include the Disney 2 movies. All of those direct to DVD sequels, like uh, Cinderella 2 and Jungle Book 2 and Atlantis 2 or even Brave Little Toaster or The Wild or Goofy Movie. Those are all part of a separate company. These are going to include the movies from Snow White to Frozen 2. These are all part of Disney Animation Studio films. So that's not going to include Pixar. You're not going to see Toy Story in here. You're going to see all of the Disney Animated Studio films. So, if you need to figure out what that list is, this is going to be that list. It's also all over the internet, so make sure you check out that list because there's some ones that I'm surprised that weren't in here. Also, this is a very hard list to create because a lot of it's going to be based off nostalgia, movies I watched a lot growing up, and I tried to not do that. I, I tried to go into the movies fresh with just a mindset of I want to watch this, think about it, and write it down and talk about it. You're going to see a lot of movies that I loved watching a lot towards the top of the list, but I tried to keep this open-minded as possible. So make sure to leave your list down below. How would you rank all 58 movies if you've seen all 58 movies? There's some ones that aren't as popular as others. What are your favorite ones and what are your least favorite ones? Coming in at number 58 is Chicken Little. I regard the mid-2000s as some of the worst times for Walt Disney. It put out flops and movies that were just okay. Disney wanted to move forward with new animation, and we got Chicken Little. Chicken Little is easily the worst Disney-looking film there is. The sci-fi elements took forever to get started, and once it does get started, you already have no interest in the movie. All of the characters from Chicken Little to his pig friend to his fish friend, nobody was interesting in this movie. The story of Chicken Little trying to prove that he is not lying about aliens is a good story, but it was not executed very well. Coming at number 57 is Home on the Range. Thank God this was not the last hand-drawn animated movie that Disney did. Home on the Range is a humorless musical comedy about three cows attempting to stop a cattle rustler. The voice cast is decent with Judy Dench, uh, there is Jennifer Tilly, Roseanne Barr, there's Cuba Gooding Jr. in the movie. The voice acting can't make these unoriginal characters stand out. And the background is bottom of the tier list for Disney. Nothing about Home on the Range is entertaining or even remotely interesting. Coming at number 56 is Dinosaur. I feel comfortable saying that Dinosaur is one of Disney's worst looking films. The high stakes regarding the movie led to no emotions at all. The movie mixed live settings with animated dinosaurs and it's so distracting because the animation for the dinosaurs is awful. I can't tell you any of the characters names even though I just watched this on Disney Plus the other day. There is no charm, there is no energy, Dinosaurs is a dull film. Coming in at number 5 is Bolt. I found the creative team behind Bolt to be quite impressive. The team behind Tangled is in here as well, but they couldn't muster up a good film. You have a good voice cast with Miley Cyrus and John Travolta, but they really give no efforts in their role, and the movie moves along with no care about how it's doing. The side animals that Bolt interact with are obnoxious and the story itself is very weak and lackluster. The animation is an improvement over films like Chicken Little, but it is easily one of my least favorite Disney movies. Coming at number four is Make Mine Music. We are getting into an odd time in Disney history. These are called package war films where during the war, uh, part of Disney's studio was taken up by military personnel and uh, so they created these small package films. You have like a few of them 
And one of them is Make Mine Music, which consisted of 10 different shorts. And this was the third War Package film. The problem with so many shorts is that it's hard to remember most of them. When one stands out, like The Blue Bayou, most of the others remain forgettable. The music that accompanied most of these shorts is good. I like the music and the shorts for Casey at the Bat and Peter and the Wolf. And Walt Disney did not like Make My Music and I can see why. Coming at number three is Fun and Fancy Free. Instead of seven or 10 shorts, this movie was split right down the middle for just two shorts. We had one about Bongo, who was a circus bear that left the circus and started to fall in love with another bear. And then we had Mickey and the Beanstalk. The narration is quite nice and the story is simple for Bongo, but it's easily the most forgettable of the two. I prefer the second short, Mickey and the Beanstalk. It was a nice setup with an adult telling the story to two young kids with a ventriloquist dummy. The dummy offers some very dark moments for a Disney movie, talking about a cow and pushing it off a cliff to kill it. But the short itself is entertaining and the animation of large objects with the giant is quite impressive. Coming at number 52 is Melody Time, another war package film. You're gonna see a trend of most of these war package films at the bottom of the list because they don't really do much for me. I like feature length movies. Melody Time offered seven shorts, which was much better than 10. Most of the shorts are entertaining and beautiful to look at, especially Once Upon a Winter Time. I do feel like Melody Time is a much weaker version of Fantasia. The movie covers a few American heroes like Johnny Appleseed, and the people they cover are all interesting. Blame It on Samba brings it back characters from Saludos Amigos, and I always found that to be really interesting. Coming in at number 51 is The Fox and the Hound. I know this is like an iconic Disney movie, but I find a lot wrong with this movie. The film spends little time with Todd and Copper as their younger selves, and they think of each other as best friends. Once Copper goes away on a hunting trip, Todd pays Copper a visit, and Copper doesn't want anything to do with him. My problem is, is that they spend a little time with them younger selves so once they are grown up you're supposed to feel sad that they're no longer friends but i just don't feel that because the development of when they were younger just does not work coming at number 50 is the adventures of ichabod and mr toad most of these films i'm seeing for the first time for this ranking video and that includes most of the war package films as well as the adventures of ichabod and mr toad i've been on the ride Mr. Toad's wild ride at Disneyland, so it's nice to actually see the story. The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad offer two short films. The short about Mr. Toad is the better of the two. Mr. Toad's story is quick and harmless and has the charismatic J. Thaddeus Toad Esquire going on a crazy ride to give up everything for a car. But he tries to clear his name after that car is stolen and the people think that Toad had stolen the car. So it's fun to watch him try to clear up his name and run away from the law while also trying to get the car as well. Then we have the short about Ichabod. The Ichabod short is haunting at times with the Headless Horseman, but is still silly as well as Ichabod is trying to wow over a girl to marry him. Both shorts are narrated very well and have good animation, but like I said, the war package films just don't do a lot for me. Coming at number 49 is The Rescuers. This film was released in 1977 and featured a story about two mice who are rescuers. The Rescuers is charming at times, but severely lacks any excitement. The animation feels cheap and undone at times. The story of animal detectives trying to solve a crime is fun at times and offers a good mystery, but at times it feels safe and doesn't try to do too much. Madame Medusa could have been a good villain in the movie, but I feel like she was not developed very well. But I am glad we got a sequel that we will talk about later. Coming at number 48 is The Black Cauldron. I do like how The Black Cauldron looks. I'm really into that time period that The Black Cauldron uh, not was released, but the time that the story takes place in. And it feels different in other Disney films, but this film drags and is quite boring. The Horned King not only has the name to be a great Disney villain, 
but also looks truly disturbing and menacing. But much like the previous film I just talked about, Madame Medusa, wasn't developed very well to actually be a menacing villain. Torn is a decent character and I like his journey to save his pig. I just wish this movie was more thrilling. Coming at number 47 is Oliver and Company. Oliver and Company is at times a dull film. Most of the animals in the film aren't memorable and at times it tries too hard to be funny. The animation looks similar to The Rescuers and both of them have that style that looks like it was painted and isn't my favorite style. Billy Joel as Dodger is easily my favorite thing in this movie and his song Why Should I Worry is one of my favorite favorite Disney songs of all time. I've had that on Alexa nonstop ever since I watched Oliver and Company the other day and I absolutely love it. Coming at number 46 is Saludos Amigos. Saludos Amigos is the first Disney war package film. I think this movie is more educational than entertaining. The film explores a lot of South American culture and I find many of the sequences to be fascinating. And the introduction of Jose a parrot who was lively and loved Samba is a good pairing with Donald the Duck. Some of the segments are fun, especially Pedro about a plane delivering mail. Saludos Amigos is a vibrant war package film, and it's one of my favorite films from that period. Coming at number 45 is The Three Caballeros. The Three Caballeros is a follow-up to Saludos Amigo, and I absolutely adore the three caballeros the three caballeros is more energetic than saludos amigos and brought on another new character panchito pistoles the movie mixed live action footage that was lively whenever the three caballeros were together it's a lot of fun i really enjoy it it has the same kind of style as saludos amigos i remember going to disney world when i was younger and getting a three caballero shirt I had some Disney pins. I just like the idea of these three characters together. And whenever they are together, it's a lot of fun. Coming at number 44 is The Aristocats. This was the last film approved by Walt Disney before his death. And besides the song Everyone Wants to Be a Cat, The Aristocats is a pretty forgettable film. It feels similar to 101 Dalmatians, but not as fun. O'Malley is a fine character amongst a bunch of forgettable cats. The film gets lively at the end with Everyone Wants to Be a Cat song, but by the end, it's not enough to save it. Coming at number 43 is The Sword in the Stone. I think the story of Arthur, who also goes by Wart, is a good story. Much like The Black Cauldron, I love that medieval time period and I like seeing it in films. Merlin is a very entertaining character. He tries to teach Arthur about a lot of things and he has a pretty good end battle sequence amongst him and Madame Mim. But I do find the end where he pulls the sword out of the stone to be very, very anticlimactic because he felt like a lot of it was leading up to that moment and it just did not feel rewarding at all. Coming at number 42 is Treasure Planet. Treasure Planet is a cool looking film. There's a lot of inventive moments in this movie and absolutely stands apart from many other Disney films. This and Atlantis really do feel similar in the style, that sci-fi action film. You could tell that there was a lot of work that went into this movie. For its story surrounding a young man searching for lost treasure in space, I expected the movie to be a lot more thrilling. The character relationships work and the designs stand out. I like Joseph Gordon-Levitt and his role, although the character may feel bland at times. And I think it was an odd choice to release it so close to Atlantis because I think they feel a little bit similar and I think that hurt Treasure Planet in the long run. Coming at number 41 is Pocahontas. Pocahontas is a gorgeous looking film and the color of the wind piece is absolutely breathtaking but the movie as a whole doesn't work the movie tries to be dark at times but also tries to mix in fluff with talking trees and friendly raccoons but it doesn't mix well besides color of the wind there isn't much also that stands out for me as memorable sequences 
Coming at number 40 is The Rescuers Down Under. I still can't get over the fact how different The Rescuers Down Under feels compared to the first Rescuers. The animation, the story, the pacing, the characters, everything just feels better. Rescuers Down Under ditches music for an adventure which was fitting for the setting of Australia. Bernard and Eva return to help save a boy and a rare golden eagle. Much of this movie feels brand new. And one thing I've always thought about when watching Rescuers Down Under, if you took Bernard and Eva and the mice out of this movie, it still could work as a separate film about a boy trying to save a rare golden eagle. So they put the rescuers into it and it's still an added bonus, but I feel like the most of the focus is on Cody trying to save this rare golden eagle. I've only seen this movie a few times and I watched, I just watched it recently on Disney Plus, but I vividly remember certain scenes from that movie when I was younger. And that tells me a lot that I actually remember watching it a lot. And I think Rescuers Down Under is a film that I'm glad happened because we got a good sequel to the Rescuers movie, which I found to be rather, eh, it's, it's okay. But this movie is superior in many ways. Coming at number 39 is Atlantis, The Lost Empire. This was a uh, gamble for Disney. It just felt, it just felt completely different than many other Disney films. It was a sci-fi film when Disney's really stuck to animal movies and princess films. And uh, this movie just felt completely different. And it felt, and I welcomed that. I really enjoyed Atlantis. I enjoy Milo as a character. I love the journey. I love how so he, determined he is to find the lost empire and how determined he is to find Atlantis. And once we get there and learn about the world and the people who live there, it's so fascinating. Um, I just love learning about like Atlantis and different things like that. So seeing this movie is really cool. It's action packed. It's funny. It's got thrills. It's overall a really good film. Coming in at number 38 is Winnie the Pooh. This is the 2011 animated film that is very sweet. It's a short film. It just kind of came and went in theaters. It didn't really leave an impact. But uh, I do remember watching this when it was first released and of course yeah, Disney Plus. You might be hearing me say that a lot. It's a, sh it's a short, sweet film. It's innocent. It has the characters of Winnie the Pooh and all his friends in it. And the stories that are told in it are charming as well. And I've always liked the style of having the book out and turning the pages and them appearing out of the book. I've always loved that. The animation is bright. It's colorful. It looks better compared to the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. But Winnie the Pooh, the 2011 movie, is still very sweet, uh, very innocent, has that same structure. As compared to many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, I, I find it to be um, not as entertaining, but still a decent film. Coming at number 37 is Ralph Breaks the Internet. While I do enjoy Ralph Breaks the Internet for its internet-based humor and its pop culture references, I think that the charm between Ralph and Vanellope is missing. It was set up nicely in the first film, but somehow manages to take a step back. Also, the plot is all over the place regarding situation that Ralph and Vanellope are in. Certain scenes that Ralph is in and he's trying to gain internet fame just feels really repetitive and separates the two characters all together. So you feel like they're off doing their own thing, which they are, and that loses that charm that was set up between these two characters in the first film. Coming at number 36 is Meet the Robinson. I've always admired Meet the Robinsons. This is one that I used to watch a lot of when I was in junior high and when it was released. It's one of their better mid-2000s Disney films. I've always loved the story and the end. It's really sweet and I love how it all kind of wrapped up the stories for all of the characters. Plot does get a bit zany with visiting the present and the future and some characters are just downright silly. But it does become fun once Lewis meets the Robinsons. The beginning with Lewis and Goob before he goes to the future, you never really get a chance to fully understand who Lewis is until he gets to meet the Robinsons. So I felt like the beginning was very rushed and is easily my least favorite part of the movie, but it does pick up and becomes a lot of fun towards the beginning and end of the film. Coming at number 35 is The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh is sweet. I think Winnie the Pooh is just an adorable character. Piglet and Roo and Kanga and Owl and Rabbit and Eeyore and Tigger, they're all just some of the coolest Disney characters there are. 
The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh is a sweet collection of shorter adventures. Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree is an iconic segment that was made for this movie. And I vividly remember watching that segment as a kid. So that one stands out amongst all of the other shorter stories. My main issue is that this film feels recycled. A lot of the segments are previous segments that Walt Disney has done. So they're nothing new for this film. I've seen the previous segments um, before I watched this movie. So it's like I already saw it again. That's one of my issues for this movie. Comment number 34 is The Great Mouse Detective. The opening sequence for The Great Mouse Detective truly terrified me as a kid. And that is why I never watched it growing up. So the first time I watched this was just a couple days ago on Disney Plus, And I'm actually glad that I watched it. I should have watched it as a kid because The Great Mouse Detective is a really entertaining film. I really enjoyed this movie. This movie feels a lot like Sherlock Holmes and there's even a reference to Holmes and Watson. Basil is a fun character and having him as the lead character made the film's runtime feel quick and easy going. Professor Radigan is a vile and one of the better villains from the 80s. I thought The Great Mouse Detective was funny, thrilling at times, and also, to, and also had a good mystery in it, and you wanted to see how this movie progressed throughout. Coming in at number 33 is Fantasia 2000. Fantasia 2000 keeps the same style as the first Fantasia film, and Walt Disney always wanted to make a sequel to Fantasia. Fantasia 2000 feels less prestigious than the first movie, and the first movie was very professional and very aware of what they were doing. You could tell that everything was just set up so nicely and it was structured so well. Here, Fantasia 2000 has a little more fun with it. That's not a bad thing. We have Steve Martin, amongst many other people, hosting certain uh, segments for Fantasia 2000. And the segments in here just aren't as charming as the original sequences. They're the same kind of ones that, you know, images might just pass through your head. There might be a story for one. There are some really good ones throughout, but compared to the Fantasia one, they're just not as charming. But Fantasia and Fantasia 2000 do remind me that music is very important in a movie and it can tell a story and it accompanies a scene so well and can make you feel so much, especially the one with the whales in the beginning. The music at the end is so grand and beautiful and watching the whales is just it's amazing and the music does a lot for that scene coming in at number 32 is the hunchback of notre dame the hunchback of notre dame is a dark movie it's also depressing at times it's sad with how quasimodo is treated throughout the movie it makes it hard to watch at times but seeing how he pushes through it all is uplifting amongst all the dark moments there is some light humor in it as well from these gargoyles that live with quasimodo at the top of the notre dame building Notre Dame looks great. There's a sweeping score that makes scenes feel grand. It's a heartwarming story at the end, and it's also very depressing at times. It's got like a mixture. Hunchback of Notre Dame is a movie I didn't watch too much of growing up, but watching it now, I think that it's a well-told story with great animation. Coming in at number 31 is Brother Bear. Brother Bear has a very important message about love compassion and taking care of one another. There are some cute side characters along the way, but that never takes away from the central plot. I love the interaction between the two bears in the story. Joaquin Phoenix voices the human that turns into the bear, and I love his journey and understanding what it takes to be a bear and his relationship with the younger bear. I thought it was all very sweet. Phil Collins' music is in Brother Bear, and it's less memorable than what he did in Tarzan. I found that to be very disappointing because Phil Collins is really great, but I can't remember much of his music from here. Coming at number 30 is Frozen 2, the most recent Disney animated studio film. And I found this film to be really good. I really enjoyed the story for this movie, but the ending wasn't executed very well. It felt very rushed. Olaf is really funny in this movie. He considers himself to be a little more mature, so it's, so it's fun watching him kind of talk about life and, you know, have questions as well. The relationship between Anna and Elsa is still not perfect. They're really working at it, which I found to be really realistic. And then there's not a lot of Kristoff, which I found to be disappointing. The music's good and uh, it's not as catchy as the first Frozen movie. There's a lot of different settings, um, different colors. I really enjoyed Frozen 2. Coming in at number 29 is Mulan. 
Mulan has a lot working for it. There is intense action, a really good story, funny characters, and Mulan, who's a character that you absolutely love. The thing I like about Mulan is the humor from Eddie Murphy as Mushu. It doesn't take away from the main plot of Mulan, and it doesn't make you change your mind about the movie at all. Mulan is a very inspiring Disney character and her story will always remain important. This is one of the rare Disney films that has it all. It has action, humor, heart, a good story, good pacing. Just there's so many things that click with Mulan. Coming at number 28 is Wreck-It Ralph. Wreck-It Ralph is full of video game references. You have Sonic in there, uh, Street Fighter, there's Bowser. The choice to have Ralph be the villain in his video game and having him be misunderstood was a smart choice because once he shares his feelings, you start to relate to the character. His relationship with Vanellope progresses really well. They really don't like each other when they first meet, but they end up being best friends at the end. And I thought that was very important and, and the story felt very rewarding at the end. The movie feels fresh. It feels energetic. There's some good action. It's funny. Overall, Wreck-It Ralph is a very surprising film. Coming in at number 27 is The Princess and the Frog. The Princess and the Frog is a very inspiring story about Tiana who wants to open up her own restaurant in New Orleans. It tells the story of chasing your dream with a likable character. One thing that I always admired about Princess and the Frog is how determined Tiana is to open up that restaurant. So it makes the story feel more urgent once she becomes a frog you feel like she has to get back to get that restaurant open in time. And if she remains a frog, she'll never actually get to fulfill her dreams. This movie is filled with very vibrant characters, good music, a good villain, good animation. Overall, The Princess and the Frog is a very good Disney movie. And Tiana is a great Disney character. Coming in at number 26 is Dumbo. Dumbo is a sad film right from the beginning after he's taken from his mother. Uh, but the moments when Dumbo is being mocked at, it's very sad that this little elephant is being treated the way that he is. But once he flies and people start cheering for him, he feels good about himself, it becomes very uplifting. I like the relationship between Dumbo and the little mice. It's all very cute. Dumbo is a very short film, but it utilizes its moments really well. It could be funny, it could be emotional, and Dumbo is just a Disney classic. Coming at number 25 is The Emperor's New Groove. The Emperor's New Groove is probably Disney's funniest film. David Spade as the Emperor is just hilarious. The jokes work for kids as well as adults. So many different people can watch The Emperor's New Groove. And the relationship between the characters progresses really well. It starts off rocky, they become best friends at the end. It's a classic story, but it works for this movie. The villain is great in the movie. This movie just is, it's very funny and it's memorable for its humor and how outlandish and energetic it is. And that's why I've always enjoyed The Emperor's New Groove. Coming at number 24 is Lilo and Stitch. Lilo and Stitch hooked you right away with its opening sequence, Hawaiian roller coaster ride and the music. It just feels so calm and warm and relaxing. From there, Lilo and Stitch ended up being an adorable, exciting film. Lilo is such an outgoing young girl who is misunderstood and meets Stitch, a science project from another planet, and they immediately spark a connection. Stitch has to learn how to live on Earth, so it's fun to watch him kind of interact with other people. Jumba and Pleakley also give the film a lot of heart and humor. Lilo and Stitch is one of those more creative Disney films, and I'm curious to see how the live action one's going to be like because I think it's gonna be really odd. But for right now, at least we have Lilo and Stitch and it's a good film. Coming at number 23 is Robin Hood. I've always enjoyed Disney's take on Robin Hood. Yes, the story kind of drags at time and it's a little bit dull and it's a little bit dull, but I absolutely love the character of Robin Hood. I like that they had the, I like how they took the character and made all the other characters animals. It's a cool choice to have that. They also took the structure of Robin Hood and made it fun. The animation, the score, the characters, all of it is really sweet. I think I like this movie more than others because I enjoy the story of Robin Hood. I enjoy all the adaptations of Robin Hood and seeing a new version of it. So seeing it with animals was a typical Disney fashion because they love animals and taking the character Robin Hood, it was a fun film. 
Coming in at number 22 is Lady and the Tramp. Lady and the Tramp is a simple, lovely film that has a really adorable end sequence with both of them eating spaghetti, pushing the meatball, and kissing. It's 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 Disney gold. It's but the story of two dogs falling in love who come from opposite sides of the track is a cute story. The movie remains cute and charming throughout with the storyline and even songs like Bella Note. The movie does a good job of making Darling and Tramp different, but also connect them throughout the movie, which makes the scenes so charming. The voice acting in here is good. The animation is good. I do like what Lady and Tramp offered, and I even liked the live action adaptation as well. I do prefer the animated movie over the live action one though. Coming in at number 21 is 101 Dalmatians. 101 Dalmatians offers a truly menacing villain with Cruella de Vil. Where other big Disney villains are focused on like taking over the world and doing a bunch of grand things, they have their scheme. Cruella de Vil is focused on killing dogs and making coats. That's why Cruella de Vil is a more realistic Disney villain because her goals are things that people actually do. Besides the villain, the simple story has a different style of animation compared to previous films. The film looks drawn rather than painted and the dogs are still adorable throughout. The movie does move a bit slow at times, but Cruella de Vil definitely keeps the movie going and entertaining. And watching all the dogs together, it's really adorable. Coming at number 20 is Tarzan. I mostly remember Tarzan growing up from the Phil Collins songs. They're iconic and they start right away. He's able to set the scene very well, but Tarzan starts off so quick with little time to get adjusted to the movie, it immediately throws you into it, so it takes some time to actually get comfortable with the movie. But from there on, Tarzan's relationship with Jane is really sweet, and watching him learn how to act like a human instead of a gorilla, it's really entertaining. And oh my god, the animation, it works so well. All those scenes of him going through the jungle, it just feels really quick, and it all is so beautifully well done. Coming at number 19 is Bambi. Bambi is a depressing film. It's sad, it's dark, it's depressing, it messes me up. Bambi is both haunting and beautiful at the same time. The moment that Bambi's mother is shot, it's, it's sad. But there is also some sweet moments throughout the movie with Thumper and Flower and the relationship with Bambi is crafted so well and feels genuine. During this short runtime, Bambi offers plenty of emotions. But one issue that I have with Bambi is the quick transition after his mother passes away to when Bambi is grown up. It all feels really quick. Coming number 18 is Frozen. Frozen reminded me a lot of a Disney classic. It's got a simple story with great music and lovable characters. The songs are catchy, even if they were overplayed so much on the radio. Elsa and Anna both were intriguing characters and were given enough development to make them stand out in the film. Olaf adds most of the humor in this movie and Sven is an adorable sidekick to Kristoff. Although the movie can get a bit predictable at times, it ended in a sweet way that brought everyone together. It's crazy how popular and successful Frozen was and still remains popular to this day. And with Frozen 2 coming out, it's going to be even popular. Coming at number 17 is Zootopia. Zootopia is a brilliant movie with great world building. The world that was created in Zootopia offers a look at different classes, regions, and environments. The movie brings together Prey and Predator and makes a great duo out of them. Jason Bateman and Jennifer Goodwin have great chemistry and the movie allows for them to build a relationship at a realistic pace. The movie looks at how different animals are treated and breaks stereotypes. The movie is hilarious, it has great animation, but what works so well is the story and the pacing for this movie. Coming number 16 is The Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid is one of the best Disney films from the 80s. It's one of those films that everybody knows. My mother's favorite Disney movie is The Little Mermaid. It's not my favorite Disney movie, but I really do enjoy The Little Mermaid. It has a lot of great songs. Under the Sea provides such energy to the film and is filled with gorgeous animation. Sebastian, Scuttle, Flounder are all adorable characters in their own way and add a lot of humor to the movie. This is a movie for everybody. Boys can love it, girls can love it, adults can love it, 
It's got a great menacing villain. It's got humor. It's got cute animals. It's got thrilling moments. It's got action scenes. Little Mermaid is a movie that pleases a lot of people and has some really good animation. Um, it's not a movie I watched a lot growing up, so I don't have that, you know, memory with The Little Mermaid. Watching it now as an adult, it's a really good film. Coming in at number 15 is Big Hero 6. Big Hero 6 is such a refreshing film. It's based on a Marvel property and sees a bunch of college students becoming superheroes. Who is alongside Baymax and who is arguably one of the most adorable Disney characters there is. With a wide variety of characters, we get different personalities to get attached to. Hero and Baymax make for a really great duo. They have a really good chemistry in the film. Baymax is adorable. Hero is a really cool character. That's a strong bond throughout the movie. It makes the ending so satisfying. The movie is creative as can be, and it's very action-packed. Coming at number 14 is Hercules. The heroic story of Hercules going from zero to hero has always been really fun to me. The movie manages to make me smile and laugh throughout. Danny DeVito as Phil is absolutely perfect. I'm not sure when they created Phil if Danny DeVito was the first person that came to mind. The movie is thrilling to watch and is filled with vibrant animation. A lot of the scenes feel grand and there's a lot of attention to details. Hercules is a character that has a lot of learning to do and the montages just feel kind of needed for this movie and add a lot of fun to it. And I love seeing Hercules, Zeus, Hades, all of those characters in here. I think that they were well realized for the movie. The animation worked for them and they had stand out amongst each other. Coming to number 13 is Cinderella. Cinderella is an enchanting Disney movie. And it has great voice acting as well, which requires sweetness from Cinderella and it works. And when you need a vile voice acting for the stepmother and evil stepsisters, it works as well. The evil stepmother and stepsister were so believable. For its time, the animation was impressive. The scenes with the mice making Cinderella's dress is charming, especially since it had a great song to go with it. In terms of fairy tales from Disney movies, Cinderella is one of the more iconic ones and definitely had the most charm. The movie is filled with adorable animation and characters, songs, absolutely stand out. This movie is very memorable from when she uh, loses her glass slipper. Everybody knows the tale of Cinderella and that's for a reason because it's such a good film. Coming at number 12 is Fantasia. Fantasia is such a creative, vibrant, memorizing film that is structured so differently from any other thing I've ever seen. An orchestra plays music and sometimes there is colors that accompany a scene that just appear from your head. The other times there's a story that goes with it and whatever it is, all of them are fascinating. Especially the iconic Sorcerer's Apprentice with Mickey in it and he's controlling brooms that are bringing in water and it's just getting out of control. That segment is uh, very iconic and one of the more well-known versions of Mickey Mouse. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, the first time I watched Fantasia was just a couple days ago. And it's crazy how this movie jumped so far on the list and it's two hours long and it's just, it's breathtaking. The music works so well the way that they use the music to tell the stories, the colors, all of it, it's beautiful, it's colorful, it's vibrant. I wish I would've watched this as a kid. Coming in at number 11 is Tangled. Tangled came out of nowhere and I absolutely loved it. I remember renting it from the library when it was released and watching it and I was like, I wanna watch this again. I really like Tangled. Rapunzel is such a sweet, likable character with interest about everything that keeps the movie fresh. Flynn Rider, has a lot of wit and humor and Maximus fills the role as the animal sidekick and provides a lot of laughs. The plot is predictable. A lot of Disney movies are predictable, but Tangled works with its characters, the animation, the songs, the humor, all of it just fits very well into this movie. And it wraps it up very nicely. And actually the Tangled show for Disney Channel is great as well and kind of expands on that universe. I'm glad Tangled was a movie that was made. I absolutely adored it and I remember watching it constantly once it was released. I think it was 2010 it came out 
I'm renting it from the library and had to renew it several times because I just watched it so much. Coming at number 10 is Alice in Wonderland. Even though Alice in Wonderland sometimes steers away from the main plot, Alice in Wonderland is charming. It's whimsical, it's vibrant, it's outlandish, it's crazy, it's weird. That's why I like Alice in Wonderland so much. The rides at Disneyland, I absolutely love. I love the characters. And I don't love the Tim Burton ones so well, but this one, it's, it's just a good film. There's so much to admire when looking at Alice in Wonderland. All the characters in Wonderland have such odd designs, but it works for this fantasy place. Alice is a character that you enjoy watching and seeing her enjoy Wonderland and trying to return home is a story that I've always admired. In terms of easygoing films from Disney and ones that just kind of have like a nice pace and just kind of a charm to it that's, like I said, really easygoing, Alice in Wonderland is at the top of the list. It's a film that you could just sit down and enjoy, watch, and you're over with. Coming at number nine is Moana. Moana was a big surprise for me. I really enjoyed Moana. Dwayne Johnson as Maui is perfect. Didn't know he can sing so well, but his character is so funny in the movie. Moana is nicely written in the story as being strong and confident. The character was hugely popular. The animation is beautiful. It's breathtaking. It's sweeping. There's a lot of scenes in the ocean. All of it just works really well. And the songs are super catchy like the song that is sung by Dwayne Johnson. It's a really catchy song. Moana was a charming good time. I wasn't expecting too much from it, but overall I really enjoyed the movie and I like the voice cast and the animation and the fun moments throughout. At number eight is Sleeping Beauty. One of my things, one of my favorite things about Sleeping Beauty is how they captured that medieval look. The animation is consistently beautiful and balances dark and light moments as well. Princess Aurora is an iconic Disney character. And Prince Philip does a lot in the movie. He just doesn't stand there and look pretty. Uh, he gets involved in the movie, which I found to be pleasing throughout. Maleficent provides the darker and often scarier moments for the movie. The fairy godmothers provide that light moments in the movie. The movie is iconic in general. We think of villains, Maleficent. We think of Disney princesses, Princess Aurora. You even have the castle in the center of Disneyland is from Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty has made an impact on Disney movies and it's for a good reason. The animation is perfect, the villain is sinister, Aurora as a good character, good story, and the uh, songs throughout is perfect as well. Coming in at number seven is Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. This is the film that started it all. This was the very first Disney movie. And after so many years, so many movies, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves still remains one of their most charming films. The movie balances a lot of dark moments especially in the beginning, and once the dwarves are introduced, the film becomes fun and endearing. The dwarves provide a lot of fun in the movie. Dopey is always, Dopey has always been my favorite dwarf. I remember going to Boston one year and my mom getting me a Dopey book that his eyes were like the diamonds and every page shined. I've absolutely loved the character. Each dwarf is different in each way and Snow White interacts with them in different ways. Grumpy is one of the more iconic dwarves amongst the seven and Dopey as well. And the Evil Queen is a prime example of a sinister character. The film still looks beautiful to this day. And even though the story isn't as exciting as Disney films, it is still one of their best movies. And for a movie that started it all, it's a movie that is still to this day really good. Coming at number six is Aladdin. Aladdin offers one of the best voice casting in any Disney movie and that is Robin Williams as the genie. Robin Williams is so upbeat in this movie you can tell that he absolutely had a blast in the role. He gave this voice acting his all. It works so well and he is one of the best well-known Disney characters. He keeps the movie funny and entertaining. The little references to other Disney movies is classic. The sweet moments between Jasmine and Aladdin provide some iconic charming moments with the song as well. The movie offers a lot of thrilling moments that previously many Disney movies didn't have. They had some thrilling action sequences. The songs are iconic. Genie is iconic. Aladdin is just an overall good film. Coming in number five is The Jungle Book. The Jungle Book is a movie that I've always loved. Baloo and 
King Louis are really lighthearted, fun characters that provide, you know, innocence to the movie and they provide, you know, catchy tunes. But they also have Ka and Shere Khan who provide more of the darker, more intense moments. Watching Mowgli navigate through the jungle and living amongst wolves is a good story to tell. The relationships that are set up in here are solid and add a lot of comedy, especially from Baloo and Mowgli. You can tell that they are the best of friends. The relationship is easygoing. It's genuine. The Jungle Book has always been a favorite film of mine. I enjoy the music, how quick it is. The pacing works really well. You have all these different characters in the jungle and each one of them have a different part in the story that works for the movie and Mowgli interacts with each one differently. Coming in at number four is Peter Pan. From its iconic villain, Captain Hook, to Peter Pan, everything about this movie is enjoyable. Although Peter Pan offers a simple plot, the movie offers many moments kids can relate to, which makes this movie innocent and charming. Neverland is a place of imagination, and how it explored makes it feel so real. The animation throughout is beautiful and pops with every scene. The morals in here about remaining young at heart works perfectly with Peter Pan leading the pack and how important it is to have fun when you are young. Wendy Darling in the movie and her little brothers in here uh, entering the Neverland, they enjoy it and watching them interact with Peter Pan and the Lost Boys is all very sweet and fun. Captain Hook is easily one of the most iconic Disney villains there is. And I enjoyed the songs in here as well as they are headed to Neverland and how they kind of stop through London. And the ride at Disneyland uh, really captures that tone and the whimsical and fun moments of Peter Pan. If you've never been on that ride at Disneyland, check it out sometime because it's a great ride. Coming in at number three is Beauty and the Beast. The film balances dark moments from the Beast as well as fun moments from all of the objects that live in the Beast mansion. The movie has the dark tones early on and the beautiful upbeat moments towards the end. Watching Beasts slowly fall in love with Belle and realize how to treat people nicely has always been one of my favorite Disney stories. The songs in here accompany the movie so well, especially the song with Beast and Belle dancing. The film can get quite emotional at times. It's funny at times. Uh, Beast is a character that I love watching the progression. Belle is a really adorable character who has interest in the simple things in life. The animation is terrific and the dark moments feel so bleak, but the bright moments feel so lively. Coming in at number two is The Lion King. The Lion King took me many years to appreciate this movie. I didn't really like it when I was growing up, but watching it as an adult, it stands out and is one of the best films I've ever seen. After many views as an adult, I can confidently say that The Lion King was the best soundtrack of any Disney movie ever. The music can make scenes emotional or upbeat. The animation is colorful and beautiful to look at. The movie is filled with great characters from, Sim from Simba to Timon and Pumbaa. Scar, the film has a great progression of watching young Simba witnessing his father's death to try to overcome it so he can head back to Pride Rock and be the king that he is supposed to be. This movie, it feels quick, but packs a lot in it. You got good relationships, uh, good songs, good animation, a good story that is adapted from a Shakespeare story. Uh, everything about The Lion King is just beautiful. The opening sequence, um, the Circle of Life song, I cried watching in theaters a couple years ago. I remember crying. It's just uh, the music does so much for this movie and the characters are so lovable. The story is uh, dramatic at times. It's emotional. Lion King is one of those movies that has it all. So if you've been paying attention, I've missed the movie. My favorite Disney animated studio film is Pinocchio. Pinocchio is easily the best animated Disney film I've seen. This movie marks the second film in the, the Disney library. And it is one of the more darker movies that Disney has created. The story focuses on a wooden puppet who is treated poorly by the world and taken advantage of. He turns into a real boy at the end with a good heart. The moment where he turns into a real boy at the end is very heartwarming and ends the movie on such a satisfying note. I absolutely, when I say absolutely love the character of Pinocchio, I truly do. These are just a few things that I had that Pinocchio. This thing, ooh, this thing's heavy. There's only 500 of these made. Uh, I love this thing. I got this in Disneyland a few years ago, um, but it sits on top of this shelf. And then this 
rare Pinocchio Funko Pop. I absolutely love Pinocchio, and I got a box full of Pinocchio stuff that sits right behind this camera. I also was happy to find this other Pinocchio Funko Pop uh, with Jiminy Cricket on his nose. This is the most recent one. I just need uh, Jiminy Cricket solo Funko Pop, and I'm good. So there you guys have it. Every Disney animated film ranked worst to best. I watched movies for months, and when Disney Plus came out, I watched most of the packaged war films, as well as some of the smaller ones, but I watched every single Disney movie, and I'm happy that I did watch them all because there's some I have never seen. And I was happy to watch all of them and experience the different eras and all the wide varieties of Disney movies. So let me know in the comment section down below, what is your favorite Disney movie? What is your least favorite Disney movie? If you've seen all 58, I challenge you to leave me a ranking down below. Thank you guys for checking out my ranking video. I know you guys have been sitting with me for a while. I do truly appreciate you guys' support on this video and uh, just on my channel in general. It truly means a lot to me. We're almost at 6,000 subscribers. And if you are new to the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button down below and click the bell notification for more up and coming videos. So there you guys have it. All 58 Disney movies ranked worst to best. Make sure to leave your comments down below. My name is Just Watch Movies and you guys stay classy too.